Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erica Ferrand. Um, as Kate mentioned, I am part of the ILD program at UCSF. And in addition to being a clinical provider in the ILD, in our ILD clinic, I also have a research program that's particularly focused on um, how we define um, and advance quality and safety um, in, in ILD care and how and studying ways in which we can improve the delivery of that care. So it is a great honor and privilege to be with you here today talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Having done my training at UCSF um, and having a lot of the same mentors that um, D Dr. Lee had, it comes as no surprise that the message of this being a multidisciplinary um, effort in providing care um, really rings true. And so um, I'm hoping to walk you through that process today. And the goal there um, is to really try to demystify what we do with the information that we're gathering. Anyone that knows me, patients, and there are some familiar faces in the room, our providers know that I use every last second of that first visit. Um, and that's because everyone that walks through the door has a story to tell. And that story takes a while to get through. It takes a while to internalize and understand. But also as a provider, it is my responsibility to really return that story with some education. And part of that education is giving patients and caregivers a roadmap for what we're going to do with the story you just told us, for the types of studies we're going to ask you to get, and what we're going to do with that information, and how the next few months and years are going to play out. And so we're going to walk through that today um, using a case. So just, oops, let's see, nope. There we go. OK. Um, first of all, why do we use a multidisciplinary approach? And the long and short of it is because making these diagnoses are hard. So just to take a minute um, to get a sense from the audience, um, how many patients here were diagnosed with pneumonia or some other lung disease, COPD or asthma, prior to getting their diagnosis of ILD? Can I get a show of hands? Okay. And then how many people saw more than one provider about their respiratory symptoms before they were diagnosed with ILD? More than two? More than three? So that really shows that making these diagnoses can be hard. Just make, landing on a diagnosis of ILD can be challenging. And then deciding the type of ILD um, is e even um, more nuanced and in, at times imprecise. And so, um, and the reason for that is because we take information from multiple different domains, right? We're asking you about your background, your exposures, your family history. We're looking at your breathing tests, your imaging, sometimes pathology. And that information um, is reviewed by experts who live in different parts of the hospital. And on any given day, there aren't a ton of opportunities for crosstalk. But what we've learned is that when we have more information, we able, the diagnostic accuracy or confidence improves. And that when we have opportunities to talk with other providers, sometimes that diagnosis will change. And that again, that confidence improves. And so because of that, professional societies have made a multidisciplinary conference where we sit down and review those cases with all of those providers with different types of expertise involved, sort of our gold standard for care. So that's the what. Here is a little bit of the nuts and bolts. So who's involved in it? The people so that generally are expert ILD uh, clinicians. Um, so those will be your ILD providers, generally pulmonologists. Um, we have our radiologists who will look at the chest imaging, pathologists. And then in any given um, uh, institution or day to day will vary for within a given institution, we'll sometimes ask other subspecialists to be involved, and that may be rheumatologists, it may be thoracic surgeons, it may be some of our lung transplant providers or gastroenterologists. All of those people are to provide additional information about the case at hand that may be relevant in making a diagnosis and coming up with a management plan. What are we reviewing? Well, we're reviewing all of the information that we've now collected in your visits and from all the diagnostic studies that we've heard about so far. And so that's the clinical information that we'll go over in a minute. It's your laboratory uh, results. It's the pulmonary function test. And then it's also looking through those, ima those images in detail 
for patterns and looking at your biopsies in detail for patterns. And the goal traditionally has been to arrive at a diagnosis, to come to a consensus on a specific diagnosis. And if we can't reach that, to, to figure out what are the next steps or the additional information we need to reach a diagnosis. But increasingly, multidisciplinary conferences are tackling um, the next step questions, like what are the appropriate therapeutic options to offer, and what is the prognosis? Questions that are particularly of concern to the patients that are coming to see us. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of walk through um, how we, how we t discuss patient cases in a multidisciplinary conference, sort of demystify that process. And in, I hope so in doing so that whether you're at the very beginning of this journey or whether you are months or years into it, it helps under, put some context behind the information that we're collecting um, and give you a framework for thinking about the disease. Okay. So I tried to highlight um, key points that I wanted to pull out in red, but even just looking at this slide, I realize I've already missed some things, so just bear with me, I'll point them out. Um, so our patient is gonna be a 69-year-old man who presents with slow, progressive onset of dry cough and shortness of breath. So age, first and foremost, is important. We know that certain interstitial lung diseases are more prevalent in older patients so for example, IPF is much more common in patients 50 and older and is uncommon in our younger patient population. Conversely, there are diseases that we certainly see more commonly in our patients that are younger. So connective tissue disease, ILD, LAM, these are diseases that we tend to see in younger patients. There's differences in um, men and women in terms of the distribution of those diseases. So your biologic sex also plays a role. And then cough and shortness of breath are universally sort of reported by patients and caregivers. And again, that's different from, from patient to patient, but they're not specific for interstitial lung disease and certainly not specific for a type. But how they present and the tempo of those symptoms can be really quite revealing. So some diseases um, will present acutely. All of a sudden, people will have a sudden onset of shortness of breath and a cough. Um, whereas other diseases, it's more of an indolent course. They, they develop over weeks to months to years. And then there's variations on those themes. There are diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which can sort of slowly progress over time, but then may be marked by these severe episodes of acute uh, deterioration, known as acute exacerbations. And so understanding how those symptoms have unfolded for a patient can be really quite revealing. We ask about your medical history for a couple of reasons. One, there are diseases that may um, suggest that your lung disease is part of a broader disease. So for autoimmune diseases, we may find evidence that there's systemic disease and your lungs are one of multiple different organs that are affected. Or we may find evidence of uh, diseases that are a consequence of your lung disease. So we think about pulmonary hypertension as an example of that. Or diseases that may affect um, acceleration um, or the natural history of your disease. So we know for patients who have uncontrolled reflux that that can um, worsen the, the time with which somebody loses their lung function. And then we also ask about diseases where the management itself has been linked to in interstitial lung disease. So an example of that is atrial fibrillation where a medication amiodarone, um, its chronic use has been linked to um, ILD. So this patient had uh, reported chronic reflux for quite some time that hadn't been treated and atrial fibrillation, but was not on a medication that we were concerned about. And then we ask about family history. We wanna know if you have a pr genetic predisposition for, to developing an ILD, or if you have a family history of autoimmune diseases that may um, increase your risk for that disease subtype. And then we get personal. Um, and we ask about exposures and hobbies and what you've done for work. Um, and so this will include first and foremost smoking because some of the, some ILDs happen almost exclusively or are far more common in patients who have smoked. And if you're smoking, we wanna know if you're currently smoking, how much, and if you quit, how much you've smoked in the past and when you stopped. 
Um, we ask about environmental exposures. And so there are lots that we know about, and there are exposures that we don't know exactly what to do with. And so the extent to how much we dig will vary from center to center. But generally, we'll ask about bird exposures, down, risk factors for exposure to mold and mildew. Um, we'll ask about hobbies, things that uh, ceramics or woodworking that we, there have, uh, there's been evidence to link to ILDs. And then we'll ask a lifetime occupational exposure. And we're specifically interested in if you've been exposed to dusts or chemicals or gases um, that increase your risk for developing lung disease. And so our patient was a former smoker. He had a down comforter. He used a nightly humidifier, wasn't sure whether or not he was changing um, the filter. And he had impossible mold exposure at work. And he reported being a retired general contractor, no specific exposures, but said he had had a lot of dust exposure over his lifetime. So as we're going through, we're kind of putting this information, pulling out these key points. And again, it's all about trying to see patterns and putting the puzzle together. And none of these things in and of itself are gonna lead us to a diagnosis, but it's after we've kind of gone through this, all this, this whole process and reviewed this information where we kind of figure out how well those pieces fit together. The review of systems. So this is really to know um, what your symptoms are, how long they've been going on for, how severe they are, and how they've changed over time. And this is beyond your symptoms in your lungs. It's to try to assess whether there's evidence for disease related to what's going on in your lung affecting other organs. And so we're going sort of head to toe through that. So this, our patient described cough and shortness of breath for three years, that was worse in the last six months. Dry eyes and dry mouth, again, these are non-specific findings, but are seen sometimes in certain autoimmune diseases. Um, heartburn, again, this, this kept coming up in the visit. Back pain and joint pain, which again, we frequently hear about, and may be uh, related to normal changes, um, related to aging, but um, also could signal that there's inflammatory joint disease. And then he also reported his fingers turning white and blue in cold weather, with something called Raynaud's. And so some of these symptoms made us really think, in addition to his uh, mother's history of rheumatoid arthritis, that maybe an autoimmune disease was underlying all of this. And then the physical exam. And I can't stress enough, I think, um, that even if we have reviewed, and we do our best to review a lot of the information that's sent in advance to our center, um, even if I've seen your CT scan and your breathing tests, it is not, um, I don't have a preconceived notion when somebody walks through the door of what's going on. It really is um, taking the information I have and placing it within the context of the story that uh, patients and caregivers are, are providing. And then adding to that, the review of systems and the physical exam to help us understand that. Um, and in doing that, we put, pull out a lot of information that we may not have gleaned otherwise. And I, I think Wendy did a really good job of driving home the point that we pick up things like um, somebody that's lost weight in the last few months because their appetite is low or because actually their work of breathing has gone up a lot. Um, or um, someone having muscle weakness that's really out of proportion to anything, any of their other symptoms. Depression and anxiety are things that come up routinely actually during the exam or in that review of systems. And so we do this again, head to toe. And of course there's a the respiratory exam and listening for crackles, but also listening to see if we hear other evidence of, of airway disease. We, we do a good cardiac exam to see, one, if there's um, evidence of primary uh, heart disease that may be explaining somebody's symptoms, but also to see whether or not your lung disease is impacting your heart. Um, and then really good skin exam and muscle exam, um, looking at, and joint exams, again, looking for evidence of autoimmune disease. So our patient had an irreg irregular heart rhythm, which we knew. He had a history of atrial fibrillation. He had that crackles at the lung bases, no wheezing. He had some abdominal tenderness. And then no rashes, no swollen or tender joints, and no weakness. 
And so when we're presenting patients in multidisciplinary conference, and also when I'm sort of in the room with someone, it's both recognizing what's present on exam and also what's not there. What's, what is absent on exam is, is also really um, quite revealing. And then the diagnostic studies. And, I, and uh, Dr. Lee went through a lot of this already, and so I'm just gonna hit, uh, kind of hit the highlights. But imaging really helps us understand what your lungs look like, right? And we take, honestly, any of the imaging we can get, although a high-resolution CT scan is what we would really like. Chest X-rays generally are pretty nonspecific for diagno diagnosing an ILD. But if you have a chest X-ray from five years ago that looks completely normal, well, that becomes really helpful. So we'll ask for all chest imaging. We'll ask for CT scans sometimes of your abdomen or if you've had some heart imaging, sometimes we can catch glimpses of the, of the lungs on there. Um, and all of that is because Old imaging is so important. I, I have so many patients that I'm like, I don't want to, you know, that CT scan was done at a doctor's office. I don't know how long ago. I don't know where to find it. Why is that important? It's because comparing what's going on now to what your lungs look like five years ago or two years ago or a year ago really puts everything into a historical context that is really, really helpful. CT scans are sort of the CT scans of the chest are most informative, and generally high resolution CT scans are what we are really hoping for. And then we'll sometimes add, ask for additional studies that may be having you lay on your stomach so we can take a good look at the dependent areas of your lungs, or having you, in addition to um, looking at the images when your lungs are full, also taking uh, pictures while you're uh, breathing the air out. And all of that is to help us find features. And the features are things um, that you've all read about on your reports that have crazy names like ground glass. Um, but we're looking for evidence of scarring and of inflammation. So scarring, those words are honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis, reticulations. The inflammatory patterns are things like ground glass opacities. We look for nodules. We look at your lymph nodes. We look at the lining of the lung. All of that is to see what features are present and what features are absent. And then depending on that, we can some, hopefully, be able to see a pattern on your CT scan. And the patterns are what contribute to the alphabet soup of ILD um, diagnose, diagnoses, usual interstitial pneumonia, UIP pattern, or a nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern, NSIP, are, are two of those examples. And then in addition to the, what the lungs look like, we want to know what they can do, right? And these are complementary pieces of information. And so the pulmonary function tests, although not specific for a diagnosis of ILD, do give us a sense of the severity of your lung disease. As scarring and inflammation, as, as scarring progresses, um, the, the lung volumes are lower. And so you can't take as big of a breath as we would expect you to be able to. And so it gives us a good sense of where you are now, and that can be compared to where you've been in the past and where you are in the future. Um, and so it's sort of a, a, a big cornerstone test for anybody that's suspected to have interstitial lung disease. The six-minute walk test is a very reproducible test that helps us understand prognosis. And we want to know whether or not you need oxygen when you're sitting still, and then what you need when you're walking around. And then we do ask for sometimes for additional testing. So an echocardiogram to see, again, whether you have primary heart disease or if there's evidence that your lung disease is affecting your heart. Um, and in some cases, uh, a bronchoscopy. Um, and that is generally for patients who are presenting acutely with symptoms to help us rule out other things like uh, uh, bleeding or most commonly an infection. Um, but most often, um, if we cannot get the diagnosis from these non-invasive studies, we're often looking to biopsy for tissue. Okay. So in our case, our patient had imaging done and the pattern came back as indeterminate. He had pulmonary function tests that had reduced lung volumes and a reduced diffusion capacity, so consistent with interstitial lung disease, but again, not specific to any type. When he walked, his oxygen levels dropped to 86% while on room air, and his echocardiogram was normal. Okay, so this is sort of all of the information that hopefully we collect before we go into a multidisciplinary conference. 
And so then what are the questions for the group in that room? Well, first and foremost is what is the diagnosis? And then what are the next steps? Does this patient need a surgical lung biopsy? And then last, what are the appropriate therapeutic options? So we're gonna go through those questions. So what is the diagnosis? What we generally do is we'll take all that information, we'll think about the categories of lung disease you saw in that first presentation, and we'll make a list known as a differential of the things that we think could possibly be going on. And so for this patient, that list was idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This was an older uh, man with a um, former smoker, and so uh, IPF was on the list. Connective tissue disease, he had some features that made us think he had an, might have an auto, underlying autoimmune disease and a family history of that. Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, he had features on his CT scan that looked like maybe that could be going on and some possible exposures in his environment. And drug-induced ILD. Well, if we gave a patient this list, it would be like, great, we've really done nothing, right, to, to kind of understand what's going on. This is, these diseases look very differently. Their treatment looks different. Their prognosis is. And so what do we do when we have a list that looks like this? And it's not uncommon that that's where we land. Well, we kind of circle back and we think about, is there, is there history that we didn't get that would help us understand? Is there a medication that he took that I didn't get in that first pass? And a lot of times, centers will send you home with questionnaires where you're asked to kind of specifically think about medications or go through your home about all different types of exposures. And that really is to help us tease out this history that may get things off of this list or make the diagnosis much clearer. Um, in his case, because we were thinking about a connective tissue disease, we sent blood work to look to see whether or not there was evidence of that. And then we thought about whether there was a role for additional imaging, whether he needed to be seen by a rheumatologist, and whether or not we were going to be unable to make the diagnosis with the information at hand and we would need more. In his case, going back and taking that additional history, he's like, you know, when I got that CT scan, I had a cold. Actually, everyone in my house had a respiratory virus and I wasn't feeling well and that's what prompted me getting that CT scan. And so we thought, oh, well, maybe what we're seeing, the reason why we can't make see a pattern is because there's something acute going on at the same time. So we should repeat that CT scan. And lo and behold, when we did, the pattern, he actually had an underlying pattern, that that acute stuff had gone away and we saw a pattern that we considered to be a definite UIP pattern. We sent him for autoimmune serologies, the blood work, and it all came back negative, and so decided that we did not need to send him to see a rheumatologist. And because of the history, ruling out other possible causes, and now a definite pattern on his CT scan, we arrived at a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So we made a diagnosis. We decided we didn't need a biopsy. What's next? And most patients, when we talk about therapeutic options, this is what they're thinking about. We're thinking about the drugs, right? What is the right medication? And I'm not here to dispel the importance of that. That is a, a, a clearly quite important. And generally, when we're thinking about it, we're thinking about, does this someone who has a lot of inflammation? Is it someone that has a lot of scar? Is it someone that has both? And then thinking about the categories of medications we have to treat scarring and inflammation and what we think is going to be the most appropriate management going forward. And that's not always the management that somebody stays on, right? You can have complications from the medication. It may not work the way we anticipate it's going to do, but we're trying to give our best guess um, at what we think is going on and the drug that's going to control your disease. But in all honesty, medication is a really small part of all of the um, components of therapy. And I think Wendy did an um, excellent job at kind of going over them, but when I think about therapeutic options, it looks more like this. That medication is normally one of the first things we talk about because that's what people want to know, right? They want to know, we want to put them on a medication to try to control the disease. I want to try to keep your lung function as close to where you are now as I can. But we also want to help you live with the disease. And the medication doesn't really help you live with the disease. It's one component. And so what are the other components of that? Well, first and foremost, it's smoking cessation, if, any, if you're still smoking when you come to see us, and understanding why avoiding secondhand smoke is important. It's oxygen therapy. 
either now or preparing you for oxygen down the road. Um, what that looks like, that's a huge life adjustment. And managing oxygen is something that takes some time to kind of get used to. And the earlier we can start that process, the better. It's education, and certainly in that first uh, visit, although I aspire to do some of the education that Dr. Lee did in her first presentation, you can't cover all of it, but certainly trying to give you the point you towards resources to learn more, opportunities like this from, by the PFF to, to engage in um, conversations with providers, um, and then and management of comorbidities. So for our patient, he had really terrible reflux. That was something we really needed to focus on um, if we wanted to have a better handle on his overall disease course, in addition to management of his IPF. Pulmonary rehab, being active, staying active, the education that goes along with that on how you breathe, how you navigate the world, how you find a community of people that understand and can help support you through this. Pulmonary rehab is sort of central to that. It's psychosocial support, right? That story that brought you into the office is the beginning of what is gonna be a story that probably looks very different from the one that you imagine for yourself. And there are other people affected by it, not just the patients in the room, but caregivers and their families. And so making sure that all of those people have support, palliative care and symptom management become an incredible resource um, for people. For many, it may be in clinical trials. So it's not only um, thinking about the drugs that we have at hand, but also thinking about the ones that are coming down the pipeline that may change how we uh, treat these diseases going forward. And then for some patients, lung transplantation. So my take home points are really that interstitial lung diseases are challenging to diagnose that the information that we ask you to gather, the, the detailed stories we ask you to tell and retell in the office, the exhaustive testing that we um, request, that that information, the more data we have, has been shown to improve diagnostic confidence. And that that multidisciplinary conference is really about exchanging that information with people who have different points of views of expertise and really arriving at a diagnosis that we all feel comfortable with. And that really is the starting point for making um, decisions about treatment and management. So I'd just like to thank the PFF for um, allowing me to come and talk to you all and for you uh, for being here. And um, look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you.